Hey everyone, we're, we're the Steam, Steam Sisters. Sisters. I'm Sandhya. And I'm Swapna. And this is the Steam League, where we get to learn about the day-to-day -day careers, aspirations, and origin stories of incredible superheroes in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. <laughs> and today we have the huge honor of being joined by science communicator extraordinaire, Kara Santamaria. So Kara wears a lot of hats. She's a science communicator, award-winning journalist, host of the Talk Nerdy podcast, co-host of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast, which is where we first heard her, correspondent on the National Geographic's Brain Games, and studying in her fourth year of clinical psychology. She really knows how to use her noggin. <laughs> <laughs> you must have a lot of hat boxes, Kara. It's so nice to see you again. Welcome to the Steam League. Thanks for having me. We're going to kick this chat off with a quick game. And it's going to be the quick fire round of questions. And we're going to be picking our questions out of this here brain. So first one. OK, first question, Kara. What's the most intriguing thing you learned in the last month? Ooh, I have learned so much in the last month because I've been reading like a storm. I finished <laughs> reading. Albert Camus' The Plague. I finished reading Tears We Cannot Stop by Michael Eric Dyson, a great book called Final Gifts, um, all about hospice care. Um, so gosh, what's the biggest thing I learned, best thing, most important thing I learned? This is a really hard one, you guys. <laughs> um, okay, here's one. It's a little deep but I think we can get into it. I'll try and keep it quick. Um, I learned from some really incredible hospice nurses that sometimes when you are in your final days or you have a family member who's in their final days, they may seem a little bit confused and they may talk about things that feel like they're losing touch with reality. But one of the most important things that you can do as a caretaker or a family member is that instead of saying, oh, grandma's confused, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about, listen and try and decode some of those messages because oftentimes this is their way of communicating a final need, uh, a final request that will help them go more peacefully. So the example they often use was um, people asking for their tickets I can't find my tickets, nothing's in order, I don't know what to do. And instead of being like, you're confused and you're remembering a time when we took trains, um, instead you could think, okay, well obviously something's not sitting right and they don't feel comfortable going on that final journey. So maybe we can work with them to help them um, figure out exactly what they need so that they can get their tickets in order. Um, and this is a very common thing and it's something that I think we can all learn from during those difficult, I think, but really meaningful stages in our lives. Yeah, wow, that is very deep. And that's a very meaningful thing to have uh, shared. So, And that's actually also your area of interest too, right? In your clinical work? Yeah, so I'm studying clinical psychology. I am existentially oriented, meaning that I approach uh, psychotherapy from an existential perspective, as opposed to, let's say, a cognitive behavioral or psychodynamic perspective, although I do utilize those, um, those orientations as well. And then my concentration is in social justice and diversity. But my main area of research interest, and hopefully in the future, the area where I would like to practice will be in end-of-life care. Your next question is, what's the most interesting topic that has crossed your desk or your mind, but never made it to the airwaves? Oh gosh, I don't even know if there is anything that we never, I mean, I've at this point done hundreds. I think I'm on episode number like 330 of Talk Nerdy or something like that, 330 something. Um, Skeptic's Guide has been around for over 700, nearly 800 episodes. I wasn't a part of all of them. And I've done so many different TV shows in science communication where we've covered literally every aspect of science. I think probably the thing that I haven't given enough focus to is maybe the E and the M of the STEAM. And I think we all kind of struggle a little bit with the math and the and the engineering or the computer science components of it, um, just because they don't always lend themselves to storytelling so easily. And so although physics and biology and, um, and to some extent chemistry and definitely psychology, anthropology, sociology, all of these things are, are easier stories to tell because they have like central human characters. Sometimes when we talk about math, um, it can feel a little bit esoteric, even though I think that's just a function of us not working hard enough. So yeah, maybe some of those math principles are things that have made it across my desk and didn't quite make it to air. 
that may be reaching airwaves in the Sometime future. Soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Well, we'll switch gears and ask you, what is your favorite food, Kara? Ooh, my favorite food. I have so many favorite foods. I mean, what do I eat the most? It's probably mac and cheese, don't tell. Um, it's so good. <laughs> it's such an easy, low-hanging fruit, and it always tastes good, and it makes me feel like a little kid. Mm. Um, but my favorite food, oh, I know. There's a restaurant here in Los Angeles called Osteria Moza. It's Nancy Silverton's restaurant. It has a Michelin star. It's way too expensive. It's a, definitely a, a special occasion restaurant. And they have a dish that's a single piece of ravioli, a raviolo, and it comes in the middle of the plate. It's about this big. And inside of it is a poached egg, and then it's served in brown butter and sage. So when you cut into the raviolo, um, the not just the ricotta, but the poached egg like kind of goes everywhere. And it's amazing. It's super indulgent. And I sometimes dream about it. <laughs> That's going on the list. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to try that. And the mac and cheese, well, that just sounds like comfort food. And we're there with you. You can switch it up to be whatever you want it to be, too. <laughs> totally. You can do it super grown up or just like a little kid. Okay. Ooh, what is your favorite place to travel to or what's your favorite city? Ooh, I mean, I've traveled all over the world. I've, I've been to every continent except for Antarctica and I still really want to go there. Um, but I think probably my favorite city would have to be Vintuk in Namibia. Um, or at least like the country as a whole, Namibia is probably my favorite place to travel. I was even lucky enough, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, to be awarded the Friends of Namibia Award by the um, Consulate of Australia, which is a very strange uh, turn of events. But I have the certificate or the plaque on my um, on my bookshelf and uh, it's like quite an honor. I don't think it actually means anything <laughs> or does anything, but I've been to Namibia several times and I really, really love it um, every time I go and I'm looking forward to getting back once it's safe to travel again. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. It sounds like you have a very deep connection with that place. I do. I actually have a tattoo on my arm. I don't know. You probably can't really see it here, but it says, um, it says I left my heart in Africa um, because I really do love the continent so much. And uh, I don't know, there's a, there's a real romanticism and a real beauty to the continent. And I think Namibia so far has been my favorite place on the continent. I hope wow. you can visit Namibia again soon. Yeah, that's such a beautiful reminder to have with you. <laughs> okay, so your next question is, you don't quite like crickets, but what is your favorite animal? <laughs> You're right. I hate crickets. They're the worst. I mean, I love dinosaurs. I know you didn't say extant. So um, I love dinosaurs. I have them all over my home. Not, re not real ones, um, but like paintings and, and models and things. And if I had to pick my favorite dinosaur, I think it would have to be Styracosaurus. It's a ceratopsian. Um, so kind of like Triceratops, if you remember that one. Um, but it has all these crazy horns coming out of the side of its head and it's like super metal. <laughs> I love that. That's <laughs> awesome. And would that not be amazing if you had actual dinosaurs all over your home? <laughs> right? <laughs> I think you'd have to call the authorities. <laughs> you'd be living in a museum. <laughs> Don't tell. <laughs> okay, so you are a jazz vocalist. Who would you want to perform with? Yeah, I, I actually studied um, jazz uh, music, jazz singing, actually, before I moved on to psychology and neuroscience. Um, I, I don't know if I would call myself a vocalist now. I think my venue is the shower, maybe the car. Um, but my dream, gosh, who would I want to sing with? Probably Ella Fitzgerald or Nina Simone. I mean, they're my heroes. They're incredible. And they did the standards like nobody else. Um, I mean, I would pale in comparison. It would be embarrassing to sing with them, but it would be like an absolute honor, so long as not that many people were listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would definitely be at that concert. Right. Sure. Well, also that means I've risen women from the dead, which is also pretty impressive. Um, but they were honestly, they were my heroes and just like such incredible role models. So yeah, that would be a real honor. You don't count yourself out. You are <laughs> a superhero after all. <laughs> Um, okay, so another question for you is, what's your favorite holiday? 
Ooh, okay. This one's easy. So my birthday is October 19th, which is not that far away from Halloween. And so growing up, even in my baby books, you see pictures of my very first birthday and my cake had a pumpkin on it and we were all dressed up in costumes. So people are in town because they haven't traveled to see their families. The parties are really fun and you get to wear costumes. Like it's the best. It's absolutely the best holiday to have a birthday near and I've taken advantage of it in full force throughout my life. As you should. It doesn't really get better than that. <laughs> no, I mean, you have a brain gelatin molds everywhere on Halloween. I even have, I have that brain mold in my pantry for that reason. <laughs> well, yeah, no one would question that. <laughs> um, I hope yours doesn't have brain freeze like ours does, though. <laughs> <laughs> and next question is, what would your superpower be, Kara? I think it would be fun to fly. Um, I don't think it's all that useful, but I dream that I'm flying sometimes and it's really fun in my dreams. So it would probably be fun to do in real life. Totally. I think that's a great skill, especially for commuters to have. <laughs> exactly. You're right. It is useful. And maybe if you could combine flying with like, not time travel, but what's the word where you like trans pose yourself like you're just instantly somewhere else that would be amazing <laughs> teleporting yes so i want to teleport by flying nice i'm with you there. same i'm with same. you if there. you figure out how to do it let us know <laughs> right i'm just going to namibia now guys i'll see y'all later <laughs> just a couple questions first <laughs> you said that you like to read a lot so question what is your favorite book in the bookcase behind you? <laughs> oh, right. So I actually have two, three, three big bookshelves like this. Um, I'm in my podcast studio right now. So everything behind me and actually in front of me, which you can't see, are mostly um, general STEAM books, right? So science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And honestly, probably my favorite book of all time is on that bookshelf. And that would be um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Dr. Oliver Sacks. Um, he was kind of my entry into neuroscience and psychology and, and made me really excited to study those things. And probably my second favorite book of all time, or I should say my favorite book by a living writer, is just behind me. Yes, right. Just behind my shoulder on this side. And that's my stack of books by Mary Roach. Um, she is an incredible science writer. And my favorite book by her is probably still the classic Stiff, which is all about what happens to your body, um, to the cadaver. Uh, if and when you donate it to science. And it's hilarious, but super respectful, very um, reverent and beautiful, and you just learn an awful lot. So highly recommend anything and everything by Mary Roach and also by Oliver Sacks. So your last quick fire question is, who would you want to share a brunch with from history? Um, somebody like Rosalind Franklin, for example, who is and was an incredible scientist. She did not get her due. You know, she was very much overshadowed by the men of her era. Although with the work that she did in X-ray crystallography, she was like a key um, person who was involved in um, helping us understand what DNA, the structure of DNA, what it looks like and really how it works. Um, but Watson and Crick, of course, overshadowed that. And so I don't want to meet with Watson or Crick. I want to meet with Rosalind Franklin. And it would be so much fun to get her perspective. And honestly, it would be an honor because, you know, we really do stand on the shoulders of giants. The difficulties that they went through before us really have made our path not easy, but a little bit easier. And yeah. so I would love to thank her for that. That's an excellent choice. I, I love that. Great answer. Yeah. <laughs> Great answer to close out the quick fire. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking part in our quick fire, Kara. Yeah, and now we're gonna switch gears a little bit to learn more about the who, what, where, when, where, and how of Kara Santamaria and her career with some career questions. Okay, so you wear many different hats in your career, Kara, which we mentioned already. So we'll start with the science communication one. What does it mean to be a science communicator to you? Ooh, yeah. I mean, people ask a lot what that is. Like when you tell somebody, oh, I'm a science communicator, they're like, a what now? A who now? I always like to say it's sort of like science journalism, but it's actually very different in that science journalism is true journalism. And what's important when you do journalism is that you really hold individuals to account. Um, so there are certain ethics required in journalism. Uh, there are certain requirements for 
publishing information. You need a certain number of sources and you really aren't the friend of the people that you're interviewing or the people that you're trying to learn more about. You want to get in there and you want to hold people accountable. So oftentimes in science journalism, we will read articles that almost seem, I don't want to say anti-science, but that are critical of science in a way that's actually very pro-science. Um, and science communication is often a little bit different because I think there is a bit of an advocacy component to it. So um, even though I have done science journalism for different outlets, I generally call myself a science communicator because in the podcast and in some of the freelance work that I do, a big part of what I do is advocate um, about science and advocate for maintaining a scientific mentality. So learning how to be skeptical yet open-minded, learning how to utilize the scientific me method to understand our cognitive biases. But generally speaking, the long and short of it is a science communicator really does translate scientific topics, principles, and most importantly, probably published um, uh, papers that are quite difficult to read for a more general audience. So that if you don't have a background in that particular science, you're still going to understand the story and you're going to be able to learn from it and incorporate it into your daily life. And that's what I try to do. And those are such critical skills. But I also want to know why is science communication important to you? Right. So, I mean, I think more than ever, we're living in an era, and especially here in the US, where science literacy is fundamentally important. And we have leaders, um, the vast majority of people in positions of power, who not only, I would say, don't um, support a scientifically literate populace, but actually are pretty actively anti-science. So they don't really trust the experts or look to them. They sow distrust, um, they sow conspiracy theories. Um, they latch on to ideas because they have a lot of truthiness, right? That's the you know truth you feel in your gut, not in books. Um, and I think that that's really problematic. So, you know, I'm somebody who thinks that education is fundamentally important to the voting public. I think that, you know, a functional democracy requires that individuals have a certain level of literacy. And I think science literacy is a big part of that because if we understand evidence-based processes, then we can promote evidence-based government. And you know, why not make decisions that we know work based on the evidence as opposed to making decisions that just benefit, you know, that lobbyists are pushing for that just like benefit interest groups. That's how we've been governing for so long and it's so dangerous. So, I mean, for me, I think science communication matters because science literacy matters. Um, and the more literate we are as a democracy, as individuals within a democracy, the stronger our country and the world really is gonna be. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And through your science communication, you make science a lot more accessible. Okay, well, your next question is, why is podcasting a great medium for sharing science stories? Right. So I think podcasting is great because it's got a low barrier to entry. So I'm lucky enough that I work in television. That's my main bread and butter. Television pays better than anything else that I do, um, but it's very feast and famine. I never know if I'm going to book a gig. I never know what's waiting around the corner. Right now I'm not on TV because of the coronavirus and that's been like a big financial strain. And also I'm lucky, you know, my foot has made it in that door. And, and since it's been in the door, you know, you work when you're working. Um, but a lot of people are probably not going to get a television show. That's sort of like a very difficult thing to do. You might be able to start a YouTube channel, which is amazing. Um, but you can start a podcast with nothing. All you need is like the built-in microphone on your computer and um, headphones, really. I mean, you can get free recording software. You can connect with people all over the world via the internet. And as you grow, you might want to update your equipment and, you know, change things around a little bit. But when I started podcasting, I had no idea how to edit. I, I, kind of knew how to interview because I'd been doing it on television, but I really did have to kind of hone that skill as well. Um, nobody's really listening at the beginning, so I was really free to fail and I was able to grow with my audience. Um, and yeah, I think that's the same for many people who want to get into podcasting. It's just a really good opportunity to 
get in this world without needing money and without needing um, an audience because you'll kind of grow as you continue on the journey. What I, Another thing I love about podcasting, I have to be 100% honest, is that um, I don't have to worry about the visual component. And that might make it sound like, oh, I'm just lazy and I wanna wear my pajamas. And yeah, that's part of it. Um, but I think even more importantly, one thing that I realized when I was guesting on other people's YouTube channels quite a bit is that a lot of the comments that came in were just about my look. So we'd be talking about a really deep, interesting concept and it would be this about the fish hook in her lip or that about, oh, did she gain weight? Did she lose weight? Oh, why is her hair that color? Why is she dying it? Oh, she's pretty. She's ugly. She has buck teeth. She has perfect teeth. Like, and it was so infuriating realizing how much of the visual component is really superficial. Like people weren't even listening to the words that I was saying. And what I love about podcasting is it strips all of that away. And now the only really sexist feedback that I get is about vocal fry because they got to figure out a way to still be sexist even if they can't see you, right? So, <laughs> oh, your voice is too gravelly. Oh, you have up speak. Oh, you don't sound very intelligent because you talk like a woman. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. that too. Dig into it. There's a lot of really good resources on vocal fry and why it's just like such a sexist thing to call a girl out for it. Hmm, wow. Uh, I definitely have been told about vocal fry, so thank you. You know, yeah. <laughs> Probably and the most common like hate mail. No, I don't want to call it hate mail, but the most common sexist email that we get on the Skeptic's Guide is about that. The yeah. woman has vocal fry. Oh, thanks. Um, Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of that you're talking about podcasting is making it um, come right back to what we we're talking about before about accessibility. It really right. does. Design store is very accessible. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is a podcaster's most important tool? I mean, I think it's probably their microphone. Um, if, if we're talking about a physical tool, I mean, if you want to talk about tools in the toolbox, like their ability to interview or their ability to listen, that is probably the most important. It's very important to know how to listen, to know when to interject appropriately, when to let somebody keep going, when to ask good follow-up questions, to not be too scripted, right? To be able to be really flexible in your approach to interviewing. Um, but if we're talking about physical tools, I would say it's probably your microphone. You know, one of the hallmarks of film production, and one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that people will kind of forgive bad video. You might be watching a film and something goes in and out of focus. Sometimes that's even a device that's used by filmmakers, or it's a shaky cam or you know documentaries a lot of times you're relying on found footage and it doesn't really bother you that much but when the audio is really difficult to understand or it's scratchy or it pops or it's tinny it's it can be so uncomfortable that people actually will tune out so if you have really clean beautiful audio and you put a lot of energy and effort into making sure that the audio sounds good people will forgive if the video is a little bit meh um, and so I think the same thing is true of podcasting you want to be in in a relatively quiet room. You wanna make sure that you have a lot of sound dampening and absorption, you know, rugs, maybe recording in your closet. That's a common thing people do because they're surrounded by clothes and that absorbs all the bounce. Um, I have a lot of books in my, in my studio. Books are really good about absorbing bounce as well. And you know, once you're ready to invest in a halfway decent mic, that's probably the first upgrade that I would make as a podcaster because a good clean audio is gonna make people feel like, man, that's a professional show. Yeah, I'm gonna take that note about recording in a closet. Yeah. <laughs> in every closet. That's what, a, no, really a lot of people, they sit on the floor of their closet surrounded by clothes. They have their their setup and it's, um and, and people who are profesh, like, People who you've been listening to who you think make a lot of money and who are like, you know, doing this for a living, they're probably recording in their closet. In yeah. hotel rooms, when I'm on the run, I have to record on the run. <laughs> on the go, I think. <laughs> I'm not running from anything. Uh, when I'm on the go, um, I'll often lay in bed with my, with my setup. I have a travel um, pair of headphones that has the microphone attached and I'll pull the covers up over my head like a tent. And then I'll record like inside the bedding tent. And that's how I get really good sound in, in a hotel. Oh, pro <laughs> that's a real pro tip right there. But also, what are you not telling us, Kara? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, we found this on your Instagram. And oh. it's like a nice 
package of all the uh, tools that you might use when you're on the go? <laughs> <laughs> yes, on the go, not on the run. Yeah, the, the headset that you're seeing there is the one I was describing. That's headphones with an attached microphone. And that's what I use for um, interviews if I'm doing them remotely usually. Or if I'm doing two interviews, I have two pairs of those headsets so we would wear them together. The Zoom and then the boom mic on the right are more for when I'm trying to get ambient sounds. So I've used that everywhere from the Amazon jungle, um, the rainforest recording the sounds of the howler monkeys and and recording the sounds of different birds, all the way to a rocket launch in Kazakhstan at Baikonur. Um, so that's a really good directional mic that you can point at pretty much anything, even if it's really far away, and collect some some audio from it. And that's something I've always wanted to do. Um, doing it on my own has been difficult, so I've only done a few episodes like that. But more sound design. So you know, when I get to when I'm lucky enough to travel somewhere and experience something or observe something um recording natural sounds and then like rolling them into the episode i think can give a really um a really cool experience that sort of transports you to being there you already have a really cool established career and you've returned to school which we think is super cool because we love learning you're studying clinical psychology which is what we talked about a bit before but what does a clinical psychologist do Right, yeah. So clinical psych is great because um, with a PhD in clinical psych, you have a lot of options. So you may teach, you may run a, a lab, you know, do experiments in psychology, but because you've also gone through the steps of you know, seeing um, clients, patients, person served, whatever you want to call them, depending on your orientation, and getting all of those clinical hours in, doing an internship, then eventually doing a postdoc, and then getting your license, clinical, clinical psychologists also do psychotherapy, right? So if you go to a psychologist, whether it's for assessment purposes, so, you know, getting IQ tested, getting um, personality tests, getting neuropsychological exams, all the way to seeing somebody because you are experiencing grief or you have an anxiety disorder or you are dealing with depression. Um, clinical psychologists can do all of those things. And so I have a lot of professors who have a private practice on the one hand, and then they also are teaching at a university or you know, psychologists who are working at the VA or a public hospital or gosh, there's just so many opportunities available. And I think that that's why it was really attractive and appealing to me. My goal personally is to work in some sort of hospice or palliative or oncology setting um, and help people who are dealing with kind of one of the most difficult phases of what I consider to be growth in life, and that's dying. You know, we are living in an era where medicine has allowed us to expand our lives and extend our lives significantly. And, you know, only a small fraction of people die suddenly. Many people live with life-limiting illnesses and know that, you know, death is approaching and they have to learn how to cope with those, whether it be years, months, weeks, or days, um, in, in whether it's a hospice setting or your pre-hospice. And I think what we don't do as a, as a society enough is to come to grips with that, be honest about it. We deny death a lot. We're afraid to talk about it. And we really don't, I don't think, respect or support people who are dealing with life-limiting illnesses and who are dealing with knowing that um, the end of life is near. And so to be able to provide comfort and care and um, education for individuals who are going through this, uh, what I, I think can be a really beautiful stage of life where there's a lot of psychological growth, there's a lot of existential exploration, you really come to know who you are, you can find a lot of beauty and meaning in, in this area of your life, your, your friends and family can become much more um, connected. And I think just bursting with love. And so, yeah, that's that's what I ultimately want to do. Probably also some research, maybe some teaching involved with that. But ultimately, as a clinician, that's the population that I want to serve. Yeah, yeah, I think that that is, I think you're right. That's such a difficult topic, but also a very important one to address. And yeah. one that needs so much more attention. So good for you. Yeah. For you. Yeah. yeah. Um, in a lot of your work, it's important to work with others, um, like your team on Skeptic's Guide. How do you cultivate your teamwork skills and what would you say is the best kind of team to work with? 
Right. So, I mean, I think uh, the most important is that there's a culture of mutual respect, right? So um, I have worked on several different teams. I've worked in many television shows. I've worked in, you know, newsrooms before. And I think one of the worst types of teams to be involved in is a team that tolerates and even fosters sexism, racism, uh, you know, um, ways that people are often disrespected within the workforce or academia, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been, you know, difficult for me <clears throat> is, is having sexist professors or having sexist executive producers. Um, so, but moving beyond that, a way to have, I think, a really functional team is to understand that everybody is um, necessary, that everybody brings something really unique to the table, to encourage and celebrate a diversity of voices in a team so that you can approach problems from all angles because you have people who have lived, you know, all different walks of life different neighborhoods, spoken different languages, experienced different cultures, they're going to bring a new perspective to the table. Um, and I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. The older I get and the more that I am involved in doing psychotherapy, the more I'm valuing and understanding the value of being able to listen. So mm -hmm. knowing that Yes, it's important to get your thoughts across in a team, but it's even more important to be able to hear everybody else's thoughts and integrate them and synthesize them. I think that makes for a really good team as people who are mutually respectful and willing and able to really listen, not just hear, but to listen. I think that's such an important point. Yeah, I, I love that. That's and fantastic. an important distinction too. So I think you're on to something there. <laughs> <laughs> And we're going to switch gears now and play a little game called yep. Explain That Photo. So you already know that we checked out your Instagram, mm -hmm. but we have more photos from there that we're going to ask you to explain a little. Are um, you ready for this, Kara? I think so. <laughs> the first one is this one. I think you talked oh. a little bit about some of your time in this place. Yeah, so that's the Peruvian Amazon in Tambopata Research Center, um, where they do some really incredible macaw research. And they observe and kind of do conservation work for these wild macaws, who unfortunately are really threatened due to the pet trade. Um, and one of the really interesting things about macaws is that it's often the case that mom will lay two eggs, but she only has the resources to raise one. So what they do to help increase the population is they'll take the uh, egg that mom kind of like rejected and then they will help incubate it and raise that chick. And so a handful of the, the birds there, although they are wild birds, are pretty familiar with the researchers. And this is a much older bird. I want to say she's like 20 years old, which is incredible. Yeah, she's like, she's she's been there a while. And um if you hold food just the right way, she'll come and get it from you near the kitchen area. Um, and of course, this is not a pet bird. She's, you know, she's not kept in a cage. She lives out her life in the Peruvian Amazon, but because she was taken care of from a young age, she's a little bit more acclimated to people. And um, and I was lucky enough to, to have her land on my shoulder once. She didn't stay long, but I was able to snap a photo. <laughs> Well, this is really cool, and it's a that's a beautiful story, and such a wonderful way to help boost the population. Yeah, and I'm glad uh, we're not macaws. <laughs> yes, and and I'm glad you don't have macaws. And I think a lot of people who, you know, keep pets um, could probably do a little bit of research, try and understand exactly where their birds came from and what kind of. Um, environmental impact that has. I, I have a real problem with keeping macaws. These are beautiful creatures that are threatened and that really should not be involved in the pet trade, um, that should have the opportunity to live out their long and um, rich lives in a lush and beautiful environment like the Amazon rainforest. The next one is this one. Oh yeah, okay, so that is a beautiful meteorite that was gifted to me by my co-host on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. 
So we were in the UK, I think two years ago now. We were in the UK, we visited Edinburgh, we visited London, and we visited Cambridge to do live events. So live SGUs and um, Skeptical Extravaganzas, which is our live uh, stage show. And we happened to be there over my birthday. And on my birthday morning, I came downstairs to get coffee and a croissant. And they were all down there and they had this gift waiting for me. They had found a little mineral shop and um, purchased this beautiful meteorite necklace for me and gave it to me for my birthday. So I wear it with pride. Oh, that's yeah. really, what a great gift. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to Axon. You some more career questions. <laughs> 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 um, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, your first one back is: What's one mistake that you've made that turned out to be a really great lesson? Oh, everything I do is a mistake that turns out to be a good lesson. I mean, this is science, right? This is how science works. You just constantly make mistakes, and the mistakes help you understand how to do better and how to get closer to uh, an understanding. It's hard because I'm not sure if I would actually call them all mistakes, except maybe just things that didn't pan out. So I started a PhD way back when, you know, I did my undergrad in 04. I graduated from, from UNT in psychology and philosophy. In 07, I graduated also from the University of North Texas from a different department in biology with a neuroscience concentration. And then I moved to New York to start a PhD in clinical neuropsychology. I was young, I had like no money, um, it was tough for me. It was cold. It was dark. I was really struggling with depression and didn't have a regular therapist. It, it was a very difficult year for me and it didn't pan out. I ended up coming to LA through a series of events. I ended up, you know, developing a really amazing career here. I don't know if I would have ever done that if I hadn't been in New York first. So I'm really glad it worked out that way. And now, of course, I'm back in a PhD program some 10, 12 years later. Um, but that said, uh, you know, it wasn't really a mistake, but it didn't work out. I was there for a whole year and took courses, taught classes, worked in a lab. And I don't want to say none of that counted because of course it counted. I learned stuff and it's, I, it's never going to leave me, but none of it was able to transfer to my new degree and, you know, it cost money. But I think that those kinds of investments ultimately are beneficial. Um, going through open doors, taking turns that maybe you didn't expect to take, trying something new, even though it's like not on paper, it wasn't on your plan. They're not really mistakes, are they? They're attempts. And those attempts, whether they work out or don't, I think in the grand scheme of things, they enrich your life. And that's mm -hmm. what's the most important. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it, it's really okay if something doesn't pan out because it leads you to the next thing. And it sounds like you live the scientific methods. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Every day. <laughs> so what's the most exciting moment of your career so far? Ooh, I've had so many really cool opportunities. You know, I've, I've met amazing people. I've worked with people's heroes in the sciences. Bill Nye and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and you know people that we grew up learning from um, who've been mentors to me and been really important um, important to my progress um, I've been to a lot of really incredible places to report on science I got to go to Morocco to report on the meteorite trade um, I spent some time in the Netherlands talking about the future of food um, I've been to the Peruvian Amazon, like we said. I've been to a lot of um, countries in Southern Africa, um, Kazakhstan to see a rocket launch. So it's really hard for me to pick one thing that has been, um, you know, the most exciting or the most important. I've just, I've been really, really blessed to be able to travel the world and meet incredible people and learn their stories. And I think, um, I don't know, all of them, all of them are the best. It's an excellent perspective to have. I love that. Yeah, and you're inspiring. You're continuing to inspire other people to meet others and like find those stories. So that's a, that's something that you're giving back as you do that. So that's great. That's the hope. That's the that's. <laughs> it's worth attempting. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So your next question is: What do you do to help you keep balance? Because you do a lot of different things. I mean, that's probably my number one priority, right? So even though. 
on paper, it looks like I'm prioritizing the podcast or I'm prioritizing my um, education or I actually do prioritize my patients when I have patients, but um, I can't do any of that effectively if my issues with mental health are uh, have me, if I don't have them. You know, I used to have a therapist that said, and it was like so eye roll inducing, but also I love it and I still hold it to this day. Like do you have your emotions or do your emotions have you, right? Because it is very important to feel um, and you really want to feel to the deepest and greatest extent. But when your feelings overwhelm you in such a way that they cripple you, they make it so that you can't function, they freeze you, um, that becomes really difficult. difficult. So, um, you know, I'm somebody who has very publicly talked about my struggles with um, depression. I have had a therapist since I was a child. I take daily medication um, for depression and SSRI. And I think that self-care, especially as a mental health provider, is fundamentally important. If I can't take care of myself, it's like in the, you know, when you the oxygen masks come down, you have to put it on yourself before you can help others because then you're gonna be more effective. So for me, that takes um, a lot of different forms. I mean, the core one is, is keeping up with my mental health care through psychotherapy, talk therapy, um, taking my meds every day, being good about getting my refills and, you know, just really taking responsibility. But it's also taking baths sometimes at night um, before the pandemic, getting massages or I have a foot massager at home and I like use this like, you know, robot foot massager and it's like hugely beneficial to me. Um, drinking a cup of tea, slowing down, watching a nice documentary or reading a book. Um, I meditate every day. Uh, I mean, not every day, but most every day <laughs> I try. I do yoga at least once a week. Um, and you know, there are days when I'm not as good at taking care of myself and there are days when I'm better. I try to drink green juice every day. I'm not always successful at that. I try to get enough sleep, not always successful at that. But the one thing I know is that I never feel guilty. It was mostly a perspective shift. I don't feel guilty taking care of myself. And I actually build self-care into my schedule. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that I get as a reward. It's something that I do as a preventive measure. Um, and, you know, I think in Western society, we're really obsessed with like progress. We're really obsessed with being productive. And um, I've really changed my perspective on what it means to be productive and what it means to be um, an important member of society. To me, that's about being educated. To me, that's about being well-rounded and it's about caring for yourself and, and in such a way that it enables you to care for others. Um, so yeah, I think self-care for me is probably, I could talk about it for another hour. It's a, such an important aspect of um, being alive and if we don't prioritize it, if we look at it like an afterthought, we suffer. And unfortunately, that should be enough reason right there. But for some of us who have a hard time putting ourselves first, um, look at it this way. When I suffer, the people around me who rely on me suffer. And I think that's even more important to remember. Mm -hmm. That's such an enlightening and compelling perspective. I that thank you for saying that it's yeah very important. an important conversation to have uh talking about how we should really prioritize self-care and yeah. as you say schedule it into your um every day like a, a preventative rather than a reward, a reward. yeah Such and be unapologetic about it i mean because i think a lot of times especially as women in male-dominated industries like um you know stem fields like production here in la um, we have learned a way to manage male egos. We've learned a way to manage our kind of tenuous positions of, of, of lack of power. Uh, we're very, we apologize a lot as women. We are not the best negotiators. We have a hard time advocating for ourselves. And this is something that is a function of societal pressure, right? And we get major backlash when we when we try to push past that, then we become like the aggressive woman. Um, and so I think one thing that is very hard for us to do is to um, be able to maintain an unapologetic stance of like, this is my time, I'm not gonna do work after 7 p.m. Or, you know, this, especially as a single woman, that's really hard because I find that people are more forgiving or more accepting if you have children 
like, oh, she has kids, I'm not gonna bother her. But, well, I don't have kids, but I still don't want you to bother me. You know what I mean? Like, this is still my time. It was my decision not to have kids. And just because I'm not caring for little ones doesn't mean I'm not caring for myself. And so, you know, setting boundaries from the beginning is really important. Um, and I think advocating for other women too, and helping to reinforce their boundaries verbally and um, through our actions to create a culture of strength that says, oh no, I'm not gonna do that because that's asking me to put myself in a position that's not healthy. Um, I think that's that's super important. It doesn't always work, but the, the more we stand up for it and the more that we advocate for each other to stand up for it, um, I think we are starting to kind of see a little bit of a change in the culture and hopefully that, that continues. Indeed, hopefully Hope so. it does, yeah. Um, so sometimes it can be difficult to effectively present scientific facts to audiences who hold tightly to their opinions. In your job, you're presenting science in engaging and, as we mentioned, very accessible ways. But how do you manage these delicate situations? Right. Yeah, that's it's tough. Um, and I think that one of the things that we have to do early on is we have to have a calculus as to what's possible and what's not. And it's tough because I've realized over the years that as effective a science communicator I am, I'm not going to convince them. Um, you know, they have a willful reason that they believe what they believe. It affects their core sense of self and identity. It affects their worldview. Um, and so I think it's first about setting goals that are feasible. It's about knowing your audience, knowing what they believe, what they don't believe, what is sort of within the realm of possibility when it comes to improving uh, the science literacy and what is going to entrench people, what's going to make them stick their heels in or maybe even back, you know, cause the backfire effect where they end up more anti-science than before you spoke to them. And so, you know, I think there are really great examples. Uh, the first step is always finding common ground. We have to agree on something. And once we find that place where we agree, then all of a sudden that kind of in-group, out-group conflict becomes more humanistic. So, okay, we're, we're in the same boat when it comes to this one thing, so let's build on that. And it is important to have those conversations because the people listening to those conversations might be your real audience rather yeah. And that person who uh, may or may not change their mind. What's one piece of advice that you would give to someone who's interested in one of your many fields? <laughs> <laughs> There's two things, and but they go together. So one is don't be afraid to allow your path to vary. So, you know, what I mean by that is you might have a transcripted sort of, or a, a very specific idea of what you plan to do in your life that you've had since you were a kid and you're going to do it in this, you know, step one, step two, step three. And then once I accomplish this, I'm going to move. And then a wrench gets thrown in the plan. You don't get into the school you expected. You get an opportunity that you never thought you would want to do. When a door opens, don't be afraid to walk through it. I think that's super important. It might work out, it might not, but everything you do is experience and everything is going to feed to where you are. There's no such thing as a traditional student anymore. I mean, be a non-traditional student. When people say, how'd you get to where you are I can tell you my story but you're not going to be able to replicate it because like your path is going to be really different from mine it's all about like who you know and what opportunities you had and what mistakes you made and where you were and what were your financial struggles and how much support did you have you know and it's it's harder for a lot of people it's harder we know we look at the evidence it's harder for people of color in this country the level, the playing field is not level. And so the path to get where you need to go might be more circuitous. Um, so the second piece of advice that goes with that is that you are alive right now. You're not gonna start living once you finish that thing you're working on. You're not gonna start living once you graduate. You know, life doesn't start once you get accepted to college. Life doesn't start once you get your college degree. It doesn't start once you finish your graduate degree or once you finish residency or whatever. You're alive right now. And if you're not experiencing your life and maintaining that perspective that you are living, so much is like being wasted and just passing by you. There are plenty of people who have families while they're in school. There are plenty of people who take a year off to live abroad you know there are plenty of people who have real life experiences they lose their loved ones they lose family members they gain new family members um you know they have life experience and if you try to shut all that down and not interact with it because you think you're not ready yet you're still in like a preamble period of your life i think that 
you're actually going to have a lot of regrets and that's so sad. I mean, just be alive right now and know that your plans can always change and adapt. Yeah, that's really good advice. Definitely, don't be afraid of open doors and new opportunities and be alive in the moment. That's right. And you're never too old to go to school, guys. <laughs> True <Look> that. <laughs> <laughs> for the foreseeable future I mean, yep you never stop learning in life anyways so absolutely yeah and if you do i mean a you haven't like don't convince yourself that you have because you're learning every day but if you're willfully trying not to learn that's sad it's you boring keep yeah it's boring you can keep growing you can keep learning um that's what life is that is very true. Absolutely. <laughs> so we love <laughs> learning about your career, all the facets of your career, and it's blowing our minds. <laughs> so we're going to try and learn a little bit more through our next segment, Show and Tell. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is my boy. He is 10 years old, even though he looks like a puppy. He's the love of my <laughs> life. He weighs about 10 pounds. I adopted him when he was only 10 weeks, so he wasn't even old enough to get his first vaccine, so we had to keep him inside until he was 14 weeks when he got vaccinated and he got um, fixed. And he's been with me as my best friend for the last 10 years. Um, you know, he's getting to that age. I have a lot of friends who have lost, um, lost pets recently, and I know it will happen eventually, but as of right now, um, I'm just enjoying every minute with him because uh, he's amazing. He's just the best. <laughs> and he's sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's absolutely adorable. Right? Me. Look, look, say hi. Say hi, buddy. <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm wearing dogs. Yay. <laughs> I'm definitely a dog person. I'm definitely the kind of person who will you know, say hi to your dog before I say hi to you on the street. Got to get better about that. And I don't know what life would be like without these guys with us. Like he just, he keeps me company every day. He was sleeping in, I have a dog bed in almost every room. Well, every room that I spend a lot of time in, um, not in the living room because he hangs out on the couch with me, but in my bedroom, he has a, you know, his nighttime bed that he sleeps in. And then in both my offices, my podcast studio and my office upstairs, he has a little bed and that's where he was before I grabbed him. Cause if I'm in a room, he wants to be in the room with me, which is just so sweet. That is it so is. sweet and it's unconditional love. That's yeah. What yeah. It's really incredible the way that dogs love for sure, because they're, they're like partly trying to protect you. They're partly very needy, you know, almost like babies, like they need you to care for them, but they also do have a fair amount of independence too. So you know that when, they choose to come be with you it's just because they want to feel your presence and be close to you and i just love that that yeah. is so so sweet and i did not know what your show and tell was gonna be yeah well i'm home so i gotta <laughs> i gotta show off my best friend yeah absolutely thank you so much for so showing us nice to meet you killer bye, <laughs> bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> i'm gonna talk in the microphone <laughs> <All right. laughs> He's that probably is. just going to fall asleep on my lap again. Yeah. <laughs> Without doubt, uh, the cutest show and tell we've seen so far. Definitely. <laughs> the only one that's alive. Takes yeah. <laughs> or takes the dog bone. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, I think we have time for just a few questions from our audience that were sent in. Shout out to all of you who sent in questions. We're going to grab our audience question box which is right here. So we'll start with this question from Parshati. Thank you, Parshati. Um, Parshati has a question about SciComm advice. What would your top tips for effective SciComm be? Right. So, I mean, we talked a little bit before about knowing your audience, but I think one, re one that seems to be really salient for people is never underestimate the intelligence of your audience, but always underestimate their vocabulary. So, you know, you're often gonna be speaking to people who are very smart people and who understand scientific concepts almost intuitively if you can explain them well. The problem is that they're often lacking the lexicon, right? We just have words in science that are shortcuts so that we don't have to circumlocute. So we don't have to use 10 words to say one thing. We can just use the one word. But when you're doing SciComm, sometimes you need to cut 
back on the jargon and you need to explain what the jargon means. And this is not specific to science. I always say if my plumber or my electrician comes over to my house and they start talking to me using plumber and electrician terminology, I'm going to be like scratching my head, not knowing what's going on. But then if they explain to me what they need to do using words that I understand, I'll say, oh, okay, I get it. So you're going to stick this to this and wire that. And eventually, you know, the, the, it'll work again or the, you know, my toilet will flush. Um, and that's, you know, that's really, really important. And it's the same thing with science. So yes, never underestimate the intelligence of your audience. Don't dumb it down, but do underestimate their vocabulary. So just make sure the words that you use are in the shared vernacular and that they're not specific words that your audience wouldn't know what they meant. That's really good advice. Yeah, definitely. This next question is from Zoe. Thanks for sending this in, Zoe. What are the best and toughest parts of your job? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the toughest part is definitely the, the pushback, the sexism, just the toxic kind of patriarchal responses that you sometimes get. Um, superficiality when you work in TV that can be really tough it can be really draining and you can start to second guess yourself sometimes you're gaslighted it's hard um, but probably the best part of my job is when I get an email whether it's from a young person saying you know you've inspired me to go into science and, and this is the path that I'm taking or from somebody who says you know I finally got treated for my depression and now I'm living a completely different life and and it's because I heard you and others talking about your journeys on, on air. Um, that kind of stuff is the reason to do what we do. And you don't get those very often, but when you do get them, they really do reinforce to you, okay, this is important. Even though I'm exhausted, even though I really don't want to do that recording today, I'm going to do it because I know that somebody somewhere out there is going to be affected by it and it might actually help them in some way. Yeah, it reminds you that you're making a difference in people's lives. It's very meaningful. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So Anita wants to know, thanks Anita, what did you want to be when you were little and how did you get interested in science? So I actually have a an autobiography that I was tasked with writing at in second grade. So of course you haven't lived much by second grade, but we were also supposed to kind of invent the rest of our lives. Um, and in my autobiography, I grew up to be a paleontologist. Um, I was always obsessed with dinosaurs. And so, you know, when it came time to actually pick a major, I actually did want to study paleo, but my school didn't offer paleo. A lot of schools don't in undergrad. And so you usually study geology, but I wasn't really that interested in geology. And I was like, I have to learn about rocks. I don't want to learn about rocks. I want to learn about dinosaurs. I didn't realize there's a whole school of paleontology that goes through gross anatomy and that that and like comparative anatomy and that's how they come about to studying dinosaurs. But most paleontologists, their background is geology. And so they understand deep time and they understand, you know, the like plate tectonics, the way that the earth looked millions of years ago. I ended up obviously going a different route. Not sorry. Although there's still a part of me that deeply loves paleontology. It's more of a hobby now. And yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And um, the funny thing is I loved science when I was a kid. And then I went through the same thing that a lot of women go through where there's a ton of stereotype threat. I started to think math and science were too hard. They weren't for me. My grades were slipping in those areas. I sort of detached from them. So when I went to college, I actually first studied vocal jazz performance um, before I took a psych class, fell back in love with psychology, then fell in love with neuroscience, and then started to have the kind of gumption through a series of really amazing professors and advisors to say, I think I can learn this stuff. I think I'm smart enough and I'm capable enough. But there was a long period of my adolescent years where I, I like many women, were like, science isn't for me. And I think that's really sad. And that's a gap we have to close. We, we got to do better for our girls. Definitely. For sure. I'm really glad that you came back to science and, and you're doing what you're doing now. That's amazing. Look at you now, a role model for future <laughs> people in your shoes, future yeah. women in your shoes. I also really like your use of the word gumption. Gumption. <laughs> Moxie. <laughs> Moxie. Excellent word. That's a good one, right? Yeah. The next question from Le Roi Pompon wants to know, what topic have you not yet covered that intrigues you? 
Yeah, so that's, you know, that that's a tough question. We tried to talk about it a little bit earlier. I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff in physics and, and, um, and cosmology that's interesting to me, but I do have a tendency to tune out a little after a while because it's not my core interest area and it feels very detached. Um, for some people, it's very existential learning about the vastness of the universe and it helps them understand their place in the cosmos. For me, I think because I contemplate my place in the cosmos a lot, but understanding the nuance of a neutron star like just doesn't do it for me. Um, and so I would like to cover that kind of stuff more because I know that my audience is really interested in it, but it's harder for me to be like, yeah, let's talk about black holes. No, I do it. I do it sometimes. But in terms of things that are like fundamentally interesting to me, I mostly cover them. I think you're even starting to see a shift in my show to more um, uh, like people of color on the show to more conversations about social justice, um, to more like uh, social science conversations because I think they're so fundamentally important and although there's a handful of people who are listeners who get grumpy about it and they're like meh give me the hard science meh you're getting political um I'm like whatever it's my show I'm gonna do whatever I want and I think it's important to talk about Black Lives Matter and I think it's important to talk about policing and I think it's important to talk about socioeconomic struggles so yeah that's what I want to do more of and I think you will see more of that coming out in the future. Go you. Yeah, that's really awesome because none of these things exist in isolation anyways. So yeah, and it's all part of the scientific process. Like science is not in a vacuum. We know this. Science is done by people and it's done contextualized within culture. You know, this stuff definitely affects science. Exactly. Definitely. And vice versa. Absolutely. Yeah, and vice versa. Your last audience question is from Mo. Thanks, Mo, for sending in the question. And Mo wants to know, how can I make sure that I'm keeping well informed? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, that's really important. And especially, are you keeping, are you actually keeping informed? Or are you just listening to like the echo chamber of propaganda? It's hard, right? TV news is, is pretty biased. I think the best news outlets on television are like BBC World News and PBS. Um, but for the most part, if you're trying to watch 24 hour news cycle stuff, even sometimes the nightly news is a little bit better. Um, but if you're like me and you get your news like on Twitter online because you like getting it fast, it's about A, following the outlets that you, you find to be the most trustworthy. There are a lot of independent organizations out there that rate the bias in news outlets. And so you can do a little bit of research and say, okay, who is giving me the facts in the most neutral way? Um, and typically that tends to be places like Reuters and AP, wire services that other people then pick up. Um, and then I think when it comes to science, it's about finding, again, these sources and also individual authors, so specific bylines that are really trustworthy. So I have a feed reader. I recommend a feed reader for anybody who's really wants to stay on top of it. I need it in order to do my um, podcast, you know, to know what's like right now in the news and science. And feed readers are great because what they do is they scrub the RSS feed. So just like a podcast has an RSS feed and you auto download the episodes every week. Um, they scrub the RSS feeds of all of the uh, online news outlets that you select and then you'll get a nice long list of all of the articles and so I can like go through my feed reader that's pulling from New York Times Science, that's pulling from Cosmos Magazine, that's pulling from Atlantic, from Science News, from National Geographic, you know, all these different outlets that I follow, Verge, um, and the conversation. Conversation is one of my favorites because it's science written by scientists. Um, but yeah, it'll pull from that and I can see what's going on in the news that week. And so, and there's a lot of different ways to do feed readers. You can just put in keywords. Um, and even Google News to some extent is a little bit of a feed reader. Um, so you can just put in keywords and see who's covering what. But yeah, it helps you stick with the, with the outlets that you trust, which I think is super important. Those are awesome pro tips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, also, I highly recommend um, a program called Pocket. It's an app that you can get on your phone. You can actually get it across your devices. So it's, an, it's a Chrome extension, but then it's also just um, an extension on your phone. So if you come across an article, but you don't have time to read it, you can save it to your Pocket, and it will save a beautiful, ad-free, um, reformatted so it's easier to read, offline version 
on your phone that you can open or on your iPad or whatever that you can open anytime and read later. Um, so it's a great way to remember all those articles that you crossed paths with that you knew you wanted to read but you didn't have an opportunity to and it also has a text-to-speech option so if you're like in the car and you want to catch up on the news it will read it to you which is very cool that is wow. very cool yeah. thank you we're going to be using that <laughs> yeah pocket has really changed the way that i that i work and I, I love it a lot well you've kind of touched on this already but our last question for you kara is what's next for kara santa maria yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm going to finish my degree, hopefully at some point. I think I'm a fourth year now. It's probably going to take about six years. Um, so, you know, I'm getting there. I'm a little over halfway done. Um, working on my dissertation, working on getting more clinical hours under my belt. E eventually I'll do my internship. That's the last year as a full-time internship. And then after that, I'll uh, need to do a postdoc before I get licensed, but at least by then I'll be, you know, Dr. Santa Maria. Um, in terms of SciComm, I want to keep going with Talk Nerdy. I'll keep going with um, Skeptic's Guide as long as they'll have me. Um, maybe one day I'll start a psychology podcast. I've been thinking about that more and more. Um, maybe like shared amongst multiple contributors. Um, and then eventually I'll be working on building out a practice, whether it be in private or in... Um, in a hospital setting, a clinic setting, maybe teach, maybe get a professorship somewhere. The TV stuff, it's like, it's not at my mercy, I'm at its mercy. So, you know, when amazing opportunities come my way, it's a calculus. Is it worth it right now? You know, in terms of the pay and the prestige, but also my passion for it. Is it something that's gonna fit with my school schedule? So it's super hard for me to know even where I'll be in six months. I can only plan so much. So basically I plan for my academic path and then I allow my um, my career path, the thing that pays the bills, <laughs> to be a little bit more fluid to expand and contract, um, which is not always the easiest. I know that the free freelance lifestyle is not for everybody it induces a lot of stress for a lot of people in some ways I'm lucky that I'm untethered you know I'm not supporting a family I'm only supporting myself so that makes it a little bit easier for me to be at the capriciousness of the market or of the you know um, of the production world COVID has put a massive wrench in everybody's plans I'm struggling just the same I'm making about half of what I made before COVID because um, I'm just relying on my podcast income so that's been tough Luckily I have some put away, but you know, that'll dry up eventually if the work doesn't come back. So we'll just have to see, hopefully opportunities arise and I just keep on surfing through. Yeah. Well, it does sound like you have a lot of amazing things in your future and we are super excited to see all of them. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to thank you for joining us on the Steam League, Kara. And for everyone who wants to check out Kara's and all the rest of the Steam League superheroes, check out our YouTube channel, The Steam Sisters, and steamsisters.ca.